Your Excellency, we are honored today to have you here with us to discuss about manufacturing agenda 20 by 30. We're grateful you've allocated time. Among all the things that you're supposed to do to serve the nation, and for that, we are thankful. Please clap for the president for being with us. Your president, as I mentioned to you earlier, this program is carefully put together. Initially, this program was supposed to be for SMEs. It was high graded. And Honorable uh, Moses Courier has put us on our toes to make sure that it happens. We're grateful because through his direct guide, uh, uh, leadership, the program will have four parts. One, the big opportunity. The people who will be lined up will be giving big picture about specific value chains and the spe specific sectors. After that, we'll, have, we'll hear from the team that will talk about the enabling environment and what we need to do to achieve that dream. Some of the panelists, Linus has mentioned, that Your Excellency have done his job already because of the things that you've said before we came here. So uh, he will not need to repeat in a lot of things that you've said. And then after that, we'll hear from the government team telling us what they will do, what they need to do to be able to take us to Vision 20 by 30. And for people who may not have heard that before, Vision 20 by 30 is manufacturing contributing 20% to the GDP by 2030. Finally, and most important, Your Excellency, will be to award 10 out of 236 SMEs who have performed exceptionally well through a program that we've done with G G GIZ, and I've seen the team from GIZ is here. They were taken through capacity building, coaching, farm level interventions, access to finance, operational efficiency, and 10 of them became the best. Some of them are displaying their wares out there, and you must have liked uh, some of them. So, Your Excellency, without taking much time, Kenya is not doing very well from the Competitive Industrial Index by UNIDO. We rank 115 out of 152. May I remind you, Your Excellency, that the same was happening in the ease of doing business. Until your direct intervention and I know because I was in that team, I was working for IBM then, that your direct intervention brought down or improved the ease of doing business from 136 in 2014-2015 to position 56 in 2019. So the competitive industrial index at 115, we just need to use the same template and the same blessing that you gave us to bring it forward to below 50. How much does it take you to sell frozen chicken between Nairobi and Jeddah? And he said here, the answer, he said four hours to fly from Nairobi to Jeddah. But also he told us from Sao Paulo to Jeddah is 17 hours. But they were selling chicken products worth $2.5 billion. Today, and maybe it's for context, as I finish, Brazil exports chicken close to a market, Middle East and Africa, South Africa, $100 million, DR Congo, $50 million. It is equivalent to all the exports that you do in this country, including tea, coffee, just chicken alone. So that, I think, is one of the conversations that we could have. Without much ado, Your Excellency, 
May I now invite the chairman of KM board, Mr. Rajan Shah. Your Excellencies, sir, invited dignitaries, captains of industry, ladies and gentlemen. Your Excellency, it is a great delight for you to join, to, to have you join here to celebrate the role of micro, small, and medium enterprises in manufacturing and recognize SMEs who have demonstrated sheer efforts towards growth, resilience, excellence, and innovation. As Kenya Association Manufacturers, we are cognizant of the role that MSC plays in the growth of this economy. As a result, we continuously hold them up and nurture them to grow their businesses to, have, to take full advantage of new and emerging markets, frontiers, both locally and globally, as you have noticed during our tour around just a while back. Your Excellency, you have time and again spoken about your passion to turn around our economy. At the heart of this is the employment creation to the millions of youth without jobs food security, and eradication of poverty, amongst others. We would like to assure you our commitment to support your cause, vision, and the plan. The share of manufacturing sector as a percentage of the GDP over the last few years has declined from 9.3% in 2016 to 7.2%, which clearly states, shows that we are not growing at the same pace as other parts of the economy. And this is what, as a manufacturing fraternity, we wish to turn around and even go beyond what was in the Vision 2030 of achieving 15% of GDP to now achieving 20% by 2030, hence calling this Vision 20 by 30. Your Excellency, with the manufacturing sector, as we desire to grow to 20% by 2030, we shall achieve 1 million extra jobs in this sector. And empirical evidence has shown that for every one manufacturing job, it creates three other jobs in other uh, ancillary sectors. We shall also increase our tax base, and, and we desire by 2030 that manufacturing is 5.2 trillion of the GDP. At the moment, manufacturing contributes nearly 30% towards the tax revenue. And by expanding this, this clearly shows the potential and opportunities we have towards higher tax revenue coming from this sector. Your Excellency, CAM has outlined four key strategic areas of focus towards achieving this vision 20 by 30. Firstly, global competitiveness. When we speak of the country's competitiveness, we are looking at our ability to sustainably produce goods and services for which there is a market at a price and a quality that the market is willing to pay for. Importantly, we no longer talk about local competitiveness, but global competitiveness because not only should we be able to sell our products in the domestic markets more competitively than imported products, but also at the same time be able to compete in the export markets globally. For manufacturers to operate effectively and efficiently, they require a business environment that enhances competitiveness. This is through the development of policies and frameworks sustainable frameworks to boost industry's production, create sustainable jobs, and increasing investments. Particularly, the sector needs a predictable and reliable regulatory and tax regime. Predictability allows investors to make projections on long-term investment decisions. On the other hand, reliability gives the investment community confidence in the stability of the economic policy regime. The second component is export-led growth. Your Excellency, 
we have, already, we have already heard how passionate you are about growing exports of this country. And we are completely aligned with you as a manufacturing fraternity. Manufacturing sector growth will not be achieved by solely relying on domestic markets. This calls for Kenya to leverage on products where we have a comparative advantage to grow our exports. This will enable us to improve our balance of payments and foreign currency reserves and enhance trade with our other EAC partners and the larger continental uh, free trade that we are now about to get into. Global supply chains during COVID have also been disrupted, including the current Ukraine crisis, which has demonstrated the need for a nation to reduce our dependency on specific markets. Here lies the opportunity for Kenya, among other African countries, to benefit from reshoring and to fully take advantage of existing trade agreements, such as AGOA, EU EPA, amongst many others. Your Excellency, if we, put, if we just take the opportunity under AGOA for the textile and apparel sector, we export 500 million shillings worth of value of goods to the US. However, the total opportunity is 500 billion. The leather sector equally has a similar opportunities which can be captured. The third component, Your Excellency, is industrialized agriculture. What do we mean by industrializing agriculture? When starting with agriculture, we should have the end in mind, meaning what markets will we serve, at what cost, and at what, quanti uh, at what quality. This is why the linkage between agriculture and industry is very crucial. We have taken a step further to find solutions that would enhance Kenya's food security through increased productivity, as well as adding higher value for our exports. This productivity, increasing the productivity of crops that impact our food security will bring down the cost of our basic staples, like our unga, and subsequently lower the cost of living. On the other hand, identifying crops with potential for higher value addition and that have a huge export op opportunities will accelerate growth and hedge us against adverse terms of trade shocks. For example, as we just saw, how avocado can be processed and be converted into avocado oil and other extracts, pyrethrum to, con uh, to make into ingredients for pe insecticides and cotton to make into fabric. The final, and by far not the, le uh, the least, uh, it, it's as important is SME development. SMEs have continued to demonstrate their ingenuity and capacity to meet the country's needs over the years. However, taxation, lack of access to finance, and inadequate capacity building are some of the hindrances that the SME sector has been uh, facing. And this is where, as Kenya Association of Manufacturers, we are very committed to hold hands with our SME sector and to carry them and to grow them into medium-sized and large organizations. Your Excellency, as outlined in your government's plan, out of the 19 million people under the Kenya workforce, only 3 million people are employed in the formal sector, whereas the other 16 million, which are outside the tax base, are primarily in the informal, micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. We need to find this is a golden opportunity for the country to grow this sector and to take them to the next level. Your commitments towards growing this sector of the economy is indeed timely and promises to unlock the potential of small businesses to implement the short and medium term. We highly appreciate the Hustler Fund, the 50 billion Hustler Fund that you are going to be launch launching, and we fully support that, and we hope that that fund can be used to grow this particular SME and uh, MSME sectors. CAM remains committed to supporting manufacturing SME and positioning the in industry prominently in the global markets. We will continue to showcase this ingenuity 
and innovation through forums such as this and the upcoming Kenya Manufacturing Summit and Expo. Your Excellency, it is my humble request and honor to invite you to also come and grace the fifth edition of the CAM Manufacturing Summit and Expo, popularly known as Changamuka Festival, which is going to be hosted at the KICC between the 1st and the 5th of November, where we shall showcase all the products made by local manufacturers, including the SMEs. Finally, Your Excellency, you have challenged us to think differently, and we shall, as manufacturers, look at all the various opportunities which are available to us to grow this, to achieve our vision 20 by 30. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, Mr. President, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm happy to be here this morning to share some bits of opportunities around industrializing agriculture and also tackle the issue of food security for our country and focus around value addition for our products. So if you look at the screen in front of you, we see that the agricultural sector uh, contributes 22.4% of our GDP um, and employing over 40% of uh, the population of Kenya. That's a huge industry and indeed what we call the backbone of the economy of Kenya. However, we still have to import about 17% of our food uh, from uh, abroad. For me, this be, uh, bestows us with a great opportunity to be able to go out there and close that gap as an industry. And, you know, as manufacturers in the agri sector, fully committed to ensure that we work with the government to ensure this is done. Now, out of uh, the agri-based industry, I mean the manufacturing sector, about half of it is actually agri-based. Goes to speak to what uh, the, uh, Your Excellency have been talking about, changing the course of agriculture in this country to be able to, you know, uh, propel the economy to the next level. Um, I, sh I show you uh, an example, you know, in Kenya when there is no uh, ugali, there is no food. Um, and maize, I'll show you per capita consumption of maize is about 70 kg per person, per annum, which is about three quarters of a bag. So it's our job to ensure that kila mtu wako na gunia yake, tu metangenezea mtu gunia yake as a country. Yeah? Um, so, and of course, wheat flour there, you can see about 41 kgs per person. So what do we need to do as a sector, as an industry? Um, if you look at uh, maize growing, and uh, I'm actually from the rift myself, and it's, it's a bit sad to see that the land is being fragmented day by day, and we need to figure out how we hold on to, I mean, hold on to the large tract so that we can be able to be more efficient in production. Um, currently, we produce about eight bags per acre, but the industry best practice is about 15 bags. So it's us as an industry to partner with the farmers, um, offer extension services to be able to see that we actually bridge that gap. Um, talk about rice, 15 bags an acre, when best practice is at 35 uh, bags per acre. And I'd like to thank you, Your Excellency. I saw what you did the other day in Kirinyaga, trying to, I mean, uh, opening the dam. Those are the kind of initiatives that we'll partner together with the private sector to ensure that we actually bridge the gap. Once productivity is improved, then we're able to feed our own populace. Um, so if you, if you look, um, one of the key initiatives, for example, the subsidy on fertilizer, and it's, it's a very welcome um, initiative, given that where we need to tackle all this is on input, yeah, one by one. So we'd like to thank you for, 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 for that initiative. And you know, like in the West, say in the US, where they've managed to lock that kind of subsidy over uh, almost in perpetuity. I'd like to request, Mr. President, that this is kept on lock and key, and probably the key thrown away uh, somewhere in oblivion. But if you look, uh, Your Excellency, for, at the graph on the far side, maize, we still have a gap of about 10% that we still get from our neighboring countries, the Ugandas, the Tanzanias. Um, that can actually be easily covered uh, by us continue partnering with the farmers in the, uh, in, across the country to be able to improve this productivity. However, the threat still remains the continued fragmentation 
of the parcels of land, uh, which then uh, kills the productivity and efficiency that we want to achieve. Wheat, on the other hand, is still a big gap. We almost support almost 85, 90%. Um, and we saw what the impact was when Ukraine was invaded. Um, that I've seen the other day, you visiting Ethiopia, and the guys in Ethiopia have done a good job to be able to almost take care of 70% of their wheat um, uh, uh, usage. So it's up to us uh, to go out there, learn the best practice, to be able to cover this gap and to be able to feed our nation. Rice has spoken to. Uh, so these are the key commodities when, you know, uh, lack of which uh, tends to make us, uh, you know, go up in arms, say there's no food in Kenya. So that, as an entity, we work together with the government to ensure we uh, cover it uh, uh, fully. I'll move quickly in, uh, because of time. Uh, I talk about value addition, and uh, if you can flip to the next uh, uh, chart, I will probably just, just take one sector, uh, which is actually a key sector for our economy. I look at tea um, as a value-added cash crop. It, this cash crop uh, gives us an exchange earning of about 23% of what we get as, an, as, a, as a nation. Um, a production of 540,000 tons um, 130 billion shillings in terms of revenue, um, but of this only 5% is value added. Now that's a pain. How do we move from a 5% to a 50% as a nation? That's where we get the dollar down to our farmers. Okay? And it's up to us as an industry, uh, as manufacturers, to be able to see that instead of exporting the raw material out there, we actually value add and be able to take it to, uh, uh, to the market. That in itself just loads $12 extra per kg to the consumer. Thinking about my mother, man, an extra 1,200 bob per kg, you know, it's an extra a kid in school and things like that. So that's, that's, that's our determination as, a, as an industry to be able to do this. It employs more than 600,000 farmers today. Um, so what do we need to do as a sector to be able to increase this from that paltry 5% to a 50% is a brainstorm that we need to have as an agribusiness sector to be able to close this gap. And we definitely promise to be part of the food security. Now, as I conclude, if you look at the graph on the far side, the production in terms of volume has always been almost consistent. But the key thing here now is, I was reading or discussing some things with some people from Rwanda, and the, where they beat us they don't have the volume, but they have the quality, which tends to fetch a higher dollar. So the question now, that we shift now from volume, we've got the volume. How do we now fetch even higher dollar through increase in um, the quality of the tea? So those are the discussions that we'll have uh, as an entity, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as the sector to be able to see that we improve and you know, add to the GDP of this country. So uh, Your Excellency, uh, we as a sector, especially in the agri and industrializing the agri sector, are really committed to ensure that we actually achieve the goal of food security as a, as a country and as a people. Thank you very much and God bless. It's really about leather. And leather comes from hide. So on the left chart there, we have some st statistics from the Ministry of Livestock around how many cows do we have, how many goats do we have, how many sheep and cattle do we have. So in the leather industry, in terms of footwear, 90% of what we consume is really from cows. So you will notice that this is from 2015, and those numbers obviously have changed, but we had a herd of 17.5 million cows in the country. So let me stop there for a second. How many of you own a cow? Raise your hands. You do, right? So we had 17.5 million cows, but out of that, only 2.6 million hides were produced. Only 2.6 million, that's a 10% conversion. So what happened to the 90%? I understand from the Ministry of Livestock that that number has kind of improved, but 75% of our hide is going to waste. So we stop there for a second. Let's talk about the global market. The leather industry is 100 billion US dollars globally. 50% of that is footwear. So let's come closer home to Africa. From an Africa perspective, believe it or not, Africa holds 20% of the entire livestock globally. 20% of livestock in the world is in Africa. That's one out of five. 
closer home, you will not believe this, but Kenya is top three in Africa in terms of holding of livestock. This is after Botswana and Ethiopia. Guys, we are number three in Africa in terms of livestock production. And when we think about all of us in terms of our intent with the cows that we have at home, it's either for milk or for meat. Nobody thinks about the hide. We do everything that it takes to ensure they have all the nutrients, the salt, the protein, to produce sufficient yield in milk and to produce the best quality meat. But hide is an afterthought. Therein lies the opportunity. Now let's talk about what's the current state in terms of value addition proposition. So currently, as we speak, in terms of finished goods, as an industry, we only produce four million pairs of shoes. Only four million pairs of leather shoes. Let's look around the room. 95 of all the men in this room are wearing leather shoes. We have a population of 55 million people. You can do the math about what the proportion of men and women will be, because primarily most of the leather is produced for a couple of different categories. One is for men's uh, dress shoes, men's casual shoes. You have school shoes. We have a population of 16 million school-going kids. And their sizes change every six months or every year, depending on you know, how big they are, pre-prep, primary, or secondary. So we have 16 million school-going kids who are only consuming a fraction of the 4 million pairs of shoes that I talked about. From an export perspective, there is zero value addition. If you look at the chart there, in terms of uh, you know, what we export, our revenues are at 15 billion shillings only. And out of that 15 billion, 89% of that is in the form of what we call wet blue. Wet blue is a processed form of rawhide that allows for preservation. So it ensures all the organic matters are removed in order so that it doesn't rot. So when you slaughter a cow, if you leave the hide there, it will rot. So it is processed in a tannery that ensures that it gets to a level of wet blue. So 89% of our exports is in wet blue. From a farmer's perception, a hide is worth an eighth of the value of the cow. And that's the exports that we are exporting. So when you look at the current value addition proposition, we start with abattoirs and traders. These are the slaughterhouses on all the different places uh, that uh, collect the cows and skin them to collect the hide. This is very labor intensive. The capital intensity comes in turning. We currently have about five major turners in the country only five who are able to process the wet blue into finished leather. After that, we have the manufacturing. This is labor intensive, yeah? The manufacturing of leather has never changed over the many years. It's still very labor intensive, and that's why it's the most durable and most, the one with the best value proposition. It really involves cutting of the leather, stitching, and then depending on the construction, it will be either DVP technology, DIP technology, or cementing. So, Right now, the opportunity that we have sitting with us, besides mopping up all the cows that we have, is to fulfill the local market needs as I've established. But in addition to that, from an export perspective, we have an opportunity to move from the current rows and hides, which is 5% being exported, the wet blue, which is currently at 89%, to increase that value proposition. So majority of what we're exporting is finished leather or finished leather goods. And finished leather goods go beyond footwear. We have belts, we have handbags, we have briefcases, the automotive industry with all the seating, the upholstery industry with all the seating. And we're in a really good uh, proposition because from a competitive perspective, we have the supply. From a global perspective, the current trends are such that when you go to China, North America, South America, the trends are, in terms of the tanneries, they're becoming very stringent in terms of uh, sustainability and their capital investment required to operate a tannery. So they are looking for places like ourselves to come and invest. Right? Because we have big pieces of land, the investment is relatively low, we have a relatively cheap labor force, so there will be opportunities for investment here to come and set up their tanneries for investment in product that can be sold across the global market. Right? So 
those are serious opportunities. So now just to highlight the opportunities, it's around the animal husbandry. Changing all of our practices so that we are sensitized at a grassroots level that hide is valuable besides the meat and the milk. It will reduce the production cost and wastage, and then improve production processes, machinery, technology, and thereby quality because we'll have investment in the latest technology when it comes to the tanning. Market accessibility. The demand right now, I can tell you as we speak, we do not have capacities in our factories. The supply is an issue. When we go through the drought season, the wet blue, you're leaving hand to mouth. And then now what has happened? Uh, wet blue has become a hot commodity. Right now, the import duty rate is about 80%. Smuggling is the next best thing. People are smuggling in like you'll never imagine. Catch me if you will, because the demand is there. So, we have various uh, trading uh, uh, areas, Comesa, Agoa, AFTA, that we can trade with. The exports will move from 15 billion to about 75 billion. More importantly, from a people perspective, we currently have only 17,000 people in our industry. Based on these simulations, we anticipate, based on that labor intensivity in the additional value addition, we can move to 100,000 people who are employed. And 100,000 people, 70% of these are in the informal sector, not the formal sector, Karyoko, Kamukunji, all of these hubs where we have very segmented or fragmented uh, industries. And uh, in addition to that, we'll be able to strengthen the skills because these are skills that require some form of competency in terms of product design, uh, chemical engineering, uh, tannery, uh, leather technology, uh, if you will. So it has a really good value proposition in terms of our young people having employment in an industry that has opportunities. So ladies, and thank, uh, thank you very much. And we hope that you see the opportunity in the leather industry. Thank you. Good morning, Your Excellency. The President, champions of industries, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Today, I'm going to talk about the opportunities in the pharmaceutical industry. COVID taught us a lesson in terms of security. We want to bring the cost of healthcare down so that the maximum population of our country can get the right medicine of the right quality and affordable. Together with that, we see an opportunity in Kenya and we see an opportunity in Africa. We talk about India, we talk about Bangladesh. We want to talk about Kenya in Africa and we have a wonderful opportunity. I'm going to take you to certain statistics here and then I will broaden my outlook on the opportunities. So first and foremost, we have a pharma industry of 1.2 billion US dollars. What I'm going to be talking here is in US dollars, not Kenya shillings. The exports right now is 100 million. Most of it goes to East Africa. And there's a huge Africa down there, Sub-Saharan Africa. 70% in quantity is imported from India, China. 60% of this is generic drugs. We have 37 plus manufacturers in Kenya, which makes us one of the biggest manufacturing hub in the sub-Saharan Africa, which tells us that we are on the trajectory and we need to make the most of it. We are presently using 50 to 60% of our capacity, which again means that we have the capacities and the more you produce, the cost of production comes down. And then we can go into vertical integration into raw materials. For every $1 that we invest, we can get back $1.5. There is a 7% growth rate. And to my opinion, that can be even more. What are the key drivers? We need to spend a bit more on the healthcare. I think any per percentage spending in healthcare is pretty low against the target we had set. The life expectancy is increasing. We talk about NCD, which is hypertension, diabetes, all these are increasing. There's increased government support through health pillars. So these are gonna drive it. 
Right now, a lot of public and private institutions are importing drugs. Now, when I talk about importing drugs, there is a patented and there is a generic arm. We're talking about the generic arm. We have a potential to increase this to 240 to 350 million dollars worth of business here, which means that when we see a protection, there are other players who are going to come into this market, which means that we have three to six factories, number of direct jobs going from 900 to between 900 and 1800, and then indirect jobs. Finished products cost more than manufacturing. So your outflow of US dollars goes less. The other cost that we don't realize is the substandard and falsified medicines. If this is not controlled, our healthcare costs will go up because of hospitalization. The other thing that was shown by some studies that locally available, locally made medicines was readily available in a short time. When we have pandemics, when we have epidemics, we need medicines very quickly. And during the COVID time, we supplied medicines very, very quickly, and we should be proud of the pharma industry there. I've talked about increasing export. There's a huge market there, and I do believe we can be an India of Africa. Why do we talk about India? Why do we talk about Pakistan? Why do we talk about China? Why don't we talk about Kenya, Kenyan jobs? That's what we are here for. The AUC Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Plan of Africa said that between 30% that is locally made and 70% which is imported, we wanted to change it around. Yeah? The same for the East African Community Manufacturing Plan. We want to change it around. And that's why we're here. What will this mean? Once we get an income, we get more factories, the costs become less because there's competition, there's innovation. This is what we need. The kind of medicines Africa needs is not the type of medicines that Western require. We have our own diseases, we have our own needs, and we need to innovate there. And that will only come through this growth. As a company, we are based in Kenya. We are the only WHO pre-qualified plant in Kenya. In sub-Saharan Africa, there are two, out of which one is in your backyard, sir. That gives us an opportunity to manufacture ARVs, malaria, TB, reproductive health, and the others. But we only manufacture ARVs and TB. Fortunately or unfortunately, this majority of this funding is from donor-funded programs. One item alone, which is an HIV product, which we already have the pre-qualification, the demand for Kenya is Th uh, million tablets a day, which is about 365 million tablets a year. We have more than enough capacity to supply the Kenyan market. What our request, and this is one product only I'm talking about, it is approximately worth $60 million in terms of value. It can give you a tax of $3 million a year and a forex retention of not less than $12, $13 million a year. I'm just talking of a 20% margin. Now, over and above job creation, uh, my life is busy, but we have not considered any other product. So there is malaria, TB, HIV, um, reproductive health, and let's not forget the bigger animal which is now coming about is the non-communicable diseases, which is the lifestyle. So opportunities, as my predecessor says, I do not want to go into, but a few of the... Um, Positives, what the government has done is the Buy Kenya, Belt Kenya policy, encouraging local manufacturing, demonstrating to buy from local manufacturers certain products, but not the HIV product, because that comes mainly from the donor-funded programs. And the donors, for example, we lost a tender worth about $40 million for a meager 5% difference. And the whole thing came from India. So you can imagine how many people lost jobs, the revenue the government has lost, including the foreign forex retention. So engagement with donors, Your Excellency, is very, very necessary because one side they are saying that they want to reduce 
funding towards more self-sustainability for countries, but capacity is not built. An example again is a good malaria product that today there is no manufacturer on the continent who has built capacity to manufacture a good malaria product acceptable to international standards. We just got our pre-qualification a month or a few months ago, so we are amongst those, but it did not build capacity because everything was imported up to day before yesterday. And now there is no subsidy in that product. So sustainability, uh, your, your excellency, is very necessary through donor engagement. One thing I would say, we have supplied in a record time an ARV product to Kemsa as a local manufacturer. As I say, thanks to the government to support local industry. Not being paid is a different story, which we don't want to engage on today. <laughs> uh, but uh, clearly, I think we have a lot to do. And numbers have shown this is, I think, $1.2 billion market is actually there. And just one item can change. And it's a huge opportunity. Thank you. I don't want to dwell too much on it, sir. A very small story of a small country called Bangladesh. In 2015, Bangladesh was exporting $25 billion of garments and apparel to the world. And they had a plan that by 2025, they want to grow their export, double it to, 20, uh, to $50 billion. We're in 2022 today, sir. Last year, in 2021, they actually hit their plan of $50 billion four years in advance. They have more than 4.2 million jobs today, and their manufacturing contribution in 2015 was 16% of their GDP. Today it is 22% of their GDP, and I'm so happy that KAM is now thinking that they want to go back to their glory of 20% manufacturing contribution by 2030. So it is possible. Bangladesh has done it. Kenya can do it. And to just to give you a little bit of perspective <laughs> of manufacturing contribution by other countries, China, 28% of their manuf uh, contribution, manufacturing contribution to their GDP, Egypt in our backyard, 30% of their manufacturing contribution to their GDP, India, 16%, South Africa, 14%, and if Kenya is at 7.2%, uh, over the years it's come down from 20, it's a shame but it's better to be honorable and accept there is a problem and let's move on and let's deliver that plan. So Your Excellency, going back to the textile apparel sector, it's probably one of the biggest supply chains in the world, huge market opportunity. Kenya today is the largest exporter under a Goa to the US. That is our number three export. It has overtaken coffee, which is now number four. It, it was $500 million, like the chairman said, and it's got 52,000 jobs. But this opportunity ahead of us, just one market, the United States, is $100 billion. If we start looking at European Union, 27 countries, another $150 billion. The total pie is $800 billion. And to me, the only lesson I know from business school is size of the pie, slice of the pie. So if the size of the pie in the US under a Goa is $100 billion, and our contribution of export contribution to that pie is $500 million, there's no need to chest thump and say, oh, we are the biggest, we are the best in Africa. Yes, you are. But globally, what have you done? You're 0.5% of US imports. It's a shame. We are duty-free. Bangladesh is doing much more than dutable. So it's a big shame for us, and there's a serious opportunity for us in one sector. And in that one sector, we have no factories left in our Hathi River EPZ full. Uh, I know this morning, Your Excellency, you talked about Naivasha. It can be a reality. It can deliver 100,000 jobs, just one park. <laughs> and we really don't have an option. We need to create jobs. And uh, Your Excellency, I'm fortunate enough that I've had this conversation with you. But yes, your agenda is spot on. You told me you have three agendas. Agenda number one, jobs. Agenda number two, jobs. Agenda number three, jobs. I think this... Your Excellency, this sector will deliver that opportunity, and it's a huge opportunity as we connect the pipeline back into the farm, farm gates, the farmers, the field to fashion story that the chairman talked about. It's possible, and it can happen, and this is the serious opportunity ahead of us that we should not lose. I know uh, Jadida talked about the leather sector, but one thing she didn't talk about, the leather business in the U.S. is $27 billion. 
Kenya has got zero percent of that business. The leather shoe import duty into the United States is 60 percent under a go is zero. It's an opportunity they've not even touched. So these two sectors, which are part of the Kenya Kwanzaa Manifesto, will deliver the jobs you want, and I'm so happy you put them on your agenda. Asante Nisana, God bless you, sir. I'm going to bring out three items. One is job creation, and this I'm doing on behalf of the sector, the automotive sector entirely. The second is to strengthen the value of Kenya shillings through the increased exports and reduction of inputs. And number three, diversification of Kenyan exports by expanding the automotive export basket. Your Excellency, if you look at the presentation here, currently we have about 4.8 million number of registered motor vehicles in this country. Out of this, we have about uh, 2.7 million uh, that are only motorcycles. Out of the 2.7 million that have been registered, about 600,000 are already out of the road, according to Motorcycle Assemblers Association. And out of this, we have about 1.9 million motorcycles that are in the border border sector. It would be very interesting for you to know that this market continues to increase by 20% annually, and therefore we expect extreme growth in this sector. When we talk about 1.9 million uh, riders, Your Excellency, currently each border border person supports about six people in a family, and therefore we are talking of about 11.4 million livelihoods supported out of this sector. We have about uh, 24 uh, rides that are made. Each motorcycle rider makes about three hours, uh, three rides in an hour. And therefore, it's very interesting to know we have just given it eight hours, and therefore we have 24, uh, 24 riders. And therefore, you can imagine 24 rides out of each bike. And if you give each ride just 50 shillings, your Excellency, that is 2.2 billion Kenya shillings per day, and we are talking of about 660 million Kenya shillings in a year. I will take us through uh, the lower part of the presentation, Your Excellency. A motorcycle has about 290 different parts. Out of the 299 or thereabout parts, Kenya has already made advancement in making some of the parts locally, Your Excellency. We have already started making seven parts, which were in the first phase. The second bit, and I will show you, Your Excellency, an example that can lift and take the sector and the training institutes that you are so passionate about. This is something that can take the training institutions to the next level because this is being made locally. The f when we started the first seven parts, Your Excellency, within three months, we had employed in the sector 2,600 people within three months. Your Excellency, Captains of Industry, um, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, mine is to paint a picture on how the construction industry will deliver 500 incremental jobs by implementation of the affordable housing um, pillar. Your Excellency, um, today our construction industry consumes about 200,000 jobs, but just with the implementation of the affordable housing pillar, we have the potential to create an additional 500,000 jobs just from this one pillar. And this is not just, I mean, going to affect the um, building and construction sector, but Your Excellency will be creating a new um, population that has disposable income, that will pay taxes, that will eat the food from the agricultural um, um, farms, that will, uh, consume, will use the border borders, and singularly this is the one sector that can unlock the opportunities in the economy. And I'll just want to paint a picture using the worst case scenario, um, only using building cost. At an average of 60 square meter, 
uh, per unit of affordable housing using only a construction cost of 40,000 Kenya shillings, knowing that today the construction cost is anywhere about at around 60,000 shillings uh, per square meter. Your Excellency, we have opportunity to generate 600 billion shillings to the economy with this one project. And this is excluding the income and revenue that will be generated by the manufacturers as their capacity utilization increases and that they're able to now go into the export market. This is just incremental um, as a result of the affordable housing pillar. Out of this, 180 billion shillings is likely to go to the fundies, the contractors that are local players in our industry. And if we look at the building materials complement, this is about 420 billion shillings. Out of this, if you assume 70% goes into local manufacturing, 250 billion shillings will go into local manufacturing of building products. Another 170 billion shillings will go into, the, into import, uh, imported products, which are businesses that are run by SMEs and MSMEs. And I am saying this as one who has actually gone through this journey. And ultimately, we'll find that at, at, at an average, um, 500,000 jobs will be created using all the linkages that you can see there. We'll be able to impact on the fundies, will be able to impact on the value chains of business, our retailers, these are our hardware stores, um, these are all the retailers and distributors, will be able to create direct jobs within the manufacturing, um, manufacturing members of, of, our, of, of the institution of Kenya Manufacturer, I mean Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and ultimately, Your Excellency, I believe that just unlocking this one initiative is going to impact on all the pillars of the Kenya Kwanzaa Initiative because we will cascade jobs, we will cascade economies, we will open up the pockets for our Kenyans, and we will impact 7.5 million Kenyans directly. So thank you very much. Mine was simply just to, to, to demonstrate why there has to be serious, serious focus on implementing the building and construction, um, opening up building and construction sector through this one incremental opportunity of affordable housing. Our journey started way back in 1992 when borrowing money in this country was a real, you had to know the bank manager, you had to be in very good terms, and at times they told you even giving you a checkbook was a, pri was a privilege. So in 1992, money cost between 21 and, 20, uh, and 30% to borrow. Coming forward, today, borrowing money from the bank cost between 13 and 14%. You can see at least we are improving, but we hope with your able leadership, Your Excellency, we can come to one digit. That will actually help the growth of the industry. Your Excellency, SMEs account for 95% of farms in most countries. Estimated 600 million jobs will be needed globally by 2030, and seven out of 10 employees will be in SME. Kenya National Bureau of Statistics 2016 report indicates SME constitutes 98% of all businesses in Kenya. SMEs contribute 33 of our GDP. Majority of SMEs in Kenya are informal. Sadly, Mr. President, 75% of SMEs die within three years of inception. In other words, Kevin is a lucky one to be among the 25% of SMEs that made it through to the, its 30th birthday since its inception in 1992. 
The objective of Kenya is to increase the income of small scale farmers in Kenya along the agriculture value chain, which is very dear to you, as I know. Now, building programs, which has been our very, very major concern and mentorship of ex by extension services and creating access to finance has made us support our suppliers who are grouped in about 3,000 farmer groups. Our flagship product, Mount Kenya Water, was not only the launching pad for Kenya, uh, for Kevian Kenya, as a company, but was a pioneer brand in, uh, in local bottled water industry. Mount Kenya Water has notably changed the lifestyle and landscape by paving way to other local and international bottled water brands since coming into the industry. His Excellency, the President of Kenya, uh, Dr. William Ruto, captains of industry and all distinguished guests, um, humbled very much uh, today to stand before you. As you can see, I embody the real hustler, and I'm glad to represent the 7.4 million MSMEs in this country who create jobs for over 15 million Kenyans. Um, so we at Market Force enable these MSMEs to access products affordably, and we link them up directly with manufacturers. I am representing the youth and the technology sector because it is a huge enabler for various industries in this country to be able to grow. Uh, so today what we do is we have um, over 125,000 dukas across the country that we are supplying these goods to on a daily basis. And we've been able to expand this operation to Uganda, Tanzania, and Rwanda as well, where we have multiple uh, dukas ordering, and we're currently working with Kenyan manufacturers and enabling them to be able to export their products into this market and not worry about how they distribute in this market as well. So we're expanding the market share for Kenyan manufacturers by doing that, and also supporting the small manufacturers in the country be able to extend their trade. So one thing I'd like to say is that we're very non-discriminatory when we come to working with Dukas and uh, Mama and Bogas. So we're very excited about the Hustler Fund and all the initiatives that the government is currently working on to spur innovation in this sector as we work with fintechs and other banks to ensure that credit is affordable for these Dukas that we work with. Uh, in the process, uh, as mentioned earlier, I won't belabor the point, but there's a lot of jobs that are created through the manufacturing sector. We employ 426 people directly today uh, who support us in this uh, distribution in the country. And we're very excited also by the administration that is uh, coming in. There's a lot of energy. Uh, we're working closely, hopefully, with the uh, new CS for trade, as well as the Kenya, Kenya Association of Manufacturers CEO, as we look at how do we continue to support manufacturers to extend the distribution network. So quickly, I'll talk about uh, the technology sector where we play, because this is very important. The last six months uh, in Kenya, the first six months of the year, over $1 billion has been invested in over 76 Kenyan technology startups. And this is a very good direction for us. What I'd like to ask is, if the government can consider setting up a sovereign fund or something that can ensure as foreign investments are coming into the country, Kenyans are also investing in these companies so that when the next Mpesa, the next Amazon, the next Google, we have money coming back to Kenyans' pockets, not all the money being exported to the foreign investors who invested in us and many other companies uh, in the space. In the interest of time, I'll just make some quick remarks. Um, Your Excellency, Earlier on, I was told I'll be invited to welcome people to Nairobi. But I told my friend, Mr. Anjoy, our work is not to welcome people to Nairobi. These manufacturers are in Nairobi. And a lot of the solutions they need are in Nairobi. So we need to discuss that. So, so it's, not, it's not just about welcoming them. Your Excellency, over the past few years, we've been engaging with the Association of Manufacturers at the Senate. 
and in many other forums. And I'm glad that in the first few days um, since we got into office as a county government, we've already met um, the Nairobi chapter um, of the Association of Manufacturers, and we've made progress on a number of issues. Number one, Your Excellency, we are determined to make Nairobi the manufacturing hub of Eastern Central Africa, and eventually <laughs> Africa. That we are determined to do it and we'll work. And that's why I'm asking the companies to come and tell us what do you need from us. What we've agreed, Your Excellency, number one, is on the issue of a unified business permit. There are too many licenses um, being paid. As of now, we are 70% in the process of actually reducing it to one license for Nairobi County. But I'll prevail upon you and my friend Moses Kuria that you also reduce the ones from national government. Because um, manufacturers and SMEs are spending more time complying than doing their work. So today you're paying this license, cash out, there's another license, the next day another license, and those avenues for rent seeking. So the county government of Nairobi, everything that we ask for will only be one license um, in the next few months. We have made progress. We are willing, Your Excellency, to also collect the national ones on your behalf. You have MCSK, you have PRISC, you have CAMP, you have so many others. We put them in one pot and then distribute. Let the business people focus on doing business, not on uh, co complying, Your Excellency. <laughs> Secondly, um, I understand the issue of multiple sessing from county to county, um, on advertising. If you're driving a truck from here to Mombasa, it's a discussion that we're having at the COG. We need to get a creative way of sorting it out because I realize there's no governor who's, uh, who's willing to let go of their you know, uh, revenue-raising uh, capacity, but still we need to have uh, you know, a way that doesn't hurt the businesses. Um, ideally, we would ask you to, to register in a county and pay that county, and of course that county would be Nairobi. The other uh, governors will not be willing to do that, but we'd like to hear your ideas on how we ensure that counties still get their revenue without stifling businesses. Our work is not to stifle businesses or to stifle manufacturing, but actually to promote uh, manufacturing. Your Excellency, uh, uh, additionally, uh, we, we had a lot of complaints on those in building and construction, um, on the system that had been there previously, um, on N NPDMS. I'm glad to note, and I'm very happy Mr. Mburu is here. Uh, our teams, both at uh, the Nairobi County Government and the KRA have been burning the midnight oil for the last three, four weeks. Next week, we'll be launching a new uh, Nairobi plan where in that uh, platform, all of the complaints that have been there from the building industry, uh, Your Excellency, have been catered for. Um, professionals in the, in the building and uh, built environment sector can track developments from the time you upload an approval to the time it comes out. There must be predictability. Nikila said you need certainty so that you know where your approval is at, what, at, uh, at whichever, whichever stage of the process. Um, Your Excellency, we're also going to launch next week at our, our new revamped revenue system for Nairobi, we call it Nairobi Pay, which addresses all of these issues. And I want to urge the, the manufacturers here, please, Lipeni Ushuru, we will serve you. Already for those in the industrial area, I am doing 39 roads. We are doing 39 roads for you. Linus forgot to mention I did for him, he's in uh, Kasarani before I was governor. We will give you the environment to do your work, but we need you to also support us to be able to serve you better. So we hope that it will be more efficient there's no payment that will be received in Nairobi after next week in cash. We are digitizing all our revenue streams. If anybody asks for payment in cash, just know it is not Nairobi County. Everything will be digitized. And we know what has been happening in, in, in part of the city, Westlands, in the CBD, and in the industrial area. Your Excellency, uh, additionally, a lot of the issues that uh, our manufacturers have is water. Um, the cost of water and the reliability of our water system. Um, we all know uh, we have a shortage. We need 850 million liters per day, we get 525. Your Excellency, through the national government and Nathi Water, we expect 140 million liters to come in soon, but there's a challenge with the NLC because of the way it lives. We ask that you intervene so that it can come faster so for us to be able to serve um, our industries and also for us to be able to, to recycle. But we will also now come to you because you've said we need a city of order and dignity. But you cannot have that dignity when many of our manufacturers are the ones who are polluting our rivers? It is yourselves. Who are polluting and, and you know, engaging in illegal dumping. Once we provide and we're designating those zones, we will have to agree on what to do. Your Excellency, in your inaugural speech, you spoke about an Nairobi Rivers Commission. 
70% of the effluent that goes into that river is industries and sewerage. We will sort out the sewerage system, but the industries need to be able to sort out their, their effluent coming out of them. <laughs> Excellency, additionally, um, as I just gone to conclude, I think we need to, and I'm glad uh, the, the, young, the, the young man who spoke just before me, talking about technology. We need to really radically ask ourselves questions about manufacturing and about where we're going. As a country, we cannot do the same thing and expect a different result, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, agriculture is great, and I'm glad I had uh, uh, my friend from Unger Group saying he's producing for us each agonia. But your CS nominee for Treasury will tell you that in as much as you're getting 24% contribution to GDP, the contribution to national revenue is less than 3%. That gap is a value chain gap, which must be sorted out, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, China in 1952, 83% of, of, of people in China were employed in agriculture. In 1977, it turned out 77%. In 2012, it's 33% because of industrialization. It doesn't mean you're killing agriculture, but you're creating value to where we create jobs. Good morning, everybody. I, um, I, I do not have anything to add to this conversation. I am thrilled by what I have had here. For once, we are having a different conversation. We are not having a conversation how difficult uh, things are, the challenges, the problems, the hurdles, and all that. We are having a conversation about opportunity. And every speaker here has spoken passionately about the opportunities that we have, from textile to leather to the whole array of opportunities in housing, in uh, uh, SME, and the whole array of that. I just want to promise you one thing, that this administration will work with you every step of the way until we redeem all the opportunities that are available for us as a country. You have persuaded me that it is possible for us to create a million jobs from the manufacturing sector. You have persuaded me that it is possible for us to move the contribution of our GDP from manufacturing from 7% to 20% in eight years. So all that, need, all that is standing between us and 20% contribution from manufacturing, and a million jobs, and all the opportunities that you have ably elaborated this morning, is continuous engagement, continuous consultation, working together, and everybody realizing that nobody has the monopoly of good ideas, sharing those ideas, and making sure that we move together as a country. I promise you, ladies and gentlemen, that I will be available, my administration will be available, the CS, uh, Moses Kuria and his team will be available, our CS for uh, Treasury will be available, so that we can actualize all these opportunities together. You have said ably, and if you, you've gone through our plan, from the whole array, from, uh, for example, leather, We've had this conversation about leather. There is absolutely no reason why today we should not be a champion in the whole leather products space because we are slaughtering three million livestock every year. We have the third largest herd in this continent. Yet, we are importing 110 billion worth of leather products into Kenya it completely doesn't make sense. As has been said here, we can increase our, our revenues. We can increase the contribution of leather to our GDP from the current 15 billion to 75 billion because we have everything to make that a reality. I want to promise you that we are very clear about what we want to do 
in the leather space. We are very clear about what we want to do in the textile space because we believe that therein lies the opportunity for us to create jobs and create wealth. And therefore, um, this conversation this morning is a very important conversation to me and to every Kenyan that is listening uh, to us. You have said yourselves very ably, we have 16 million kids in school, they need a pair of shoes every year. We have um, we only produce four million um, uh, pairs of shoes. Never mind all the leather products that would come with it. And we have the raw material right here. The raw material is rotting, and yet we are importing leather products, shoes, using other people's hides and skin when ours is going to waste. It doesn't require any genius. You know, we, we don't have, there is nothing for us to have a conversation about. We just need to connect our raw materials to the market, jobs in between, money in between, and all of us will be doing well. So it is my intention that this great potential that we've always had, the great opportunity that we have always had, we must make it a reality in the next couple of years. And I am prepared, I am willing to work with you in that space. All the paperwork has been done. All the um, uh, uh, plans have been documented. All we need to do is to plug and play. Make sure we bring this to a reality. And ladies and gentlemen, I am here, lock, stock, and barrel to work with you so that we can actualize those opportunities. <laughs> The leather space, the, 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 the cotton uh, uh, value chain is, is a big value chain that can give us all the jobs we need. You just heard here, we have a market already negotiated by policymakers. 150 billion or 300 billion uh, dollar market. We are only doing 500 million dollars on textile. We have the biggest resources around Kenya. We have the Dongo Kundu Special Economic Zone, which is going to be a huge plan for us. We have the Naivasha Industrial uh, Zone, which is going to be another big investment opportunity for us as an administration, so that we can leverage on the steam that we have for free. We can leverage on the uh, energy at a lower cost, and we can build the whole ecosystem that will aggregate what we are producing. Listening to the small producers that I listen to outside here, and listening to Tesh, it speaks to the power of aggregation. How do we make sure that every small producer and every small uh, manufacturer and everybody who is adding some value to some product is aggregated and make, made possible for them to access the markets. I just want to ask, to ask industry, the captains of industry sitting here, ladies and gentlemen, there is absolutely no reason why we are selling our tea and process 95 percent in a space where we have the biggest competitive advantage i want to promise you that whatever government is supposed to do i have already had a conversation with our tea marketers and i have told them that if it is required of me to invest in a common user facility so that we can add value to our tea, the government of Kenya is going to invest in a common use of tea. It is not going to be possible and practical for us to continue to export our tea unprocessed, 95% of it. We are getting 120 billion now. We can get three, 400 billion shillings by merely adding value, period. The farmers are already working too hard to produce the tea. Who is failing our farmers? Our manufacturers. You guys. 
you're failing our farmers. Our farmers are producing all the tea, the third largest producer in the world, on half an acre, on one acre, on two acres. What we are, what we are doing, we are failing them because we are, we are not adding value to what they are producing. We are continuing to sell our tea in the auction. We are getting uh, uh, peanuts for it and many other people who do not have a single push, who do not have a single bush of tea, are making more money than us. <laughs> Good people, our manufacturers, give us the value of our tea. You are the people who is standing between us and money. <laughs> True? We are, our farmers are working so hard with close to 30 million un, uh, uh, units of herd of livestock. They have 3 million hides and skins every year. Is it being eaten by dogs? It's rotting? It's being buried in some places? When I went round Kenya with, um, with our economic uh, fora, this was the issue everywhere. Mandera, Wajia, Tana River, the whole of that space, Kajiado. Farmers were asking us, we are livestock uh, uh, keepers were asking us, what are we going to do with our skin? Who, asked, who is this group of people standing between us and the value that we can get from our skins and hides? You people. You are the people standing between us and 75 billion of a product that we can sell. And we have a ready market, starting from our own children in school. Even the local market in Kenya alone, we are importing 12, 15 million pairs of shoes alone every year. Market is not the problem. Raw material is not the problem. The problem is the people to add value. They are sitting right here. True or not true? So, good people, as I said earlier, we must have a different conversation. We are having a conversation here about, or oh, you see, we have a problem with VAT refund. How does VAT refund stop us from adding value to the hives and skins that are going to waste? Muniambie. You know? So, and I'm not saying that there are no challenges. There are challenges. But there are bigger opportunities than challenges in our space in Kenya. <laughs> Let us focus. Let us focus more in the opportunities that exist and less in the challenges that we have. We can overcome the challenges by leveraging on the huge opportunity that we have. We have a huge market. In ESC, in Africa Continental Free Trade Area, we now have the market infrastructure for us to take over the market in our continent. The reason why our continent is importing milk, powder, food, is because Kenya has not taken its place. Kenya is supposed to be the country that would position Africa appropriately to be able to make sure that we supply every commodity, every product that we should. Instead, we are having a quarrel, small quarrel. Oh, Uganda is bringing uh, uh, cheaper, cheaper milk. Uganda should bring cheaper milk because they can produce it more, much more cheaply. We should be adding value to our own milk. We add value to our own milk, and I want to say here, we had a program of uh, improving on our milk uh, value chain. We had first 300 uh, milk coolers. That product was sabotaged, that uh, program was sabotaged because of interest, but I have gone back to that product. We are going to have another 660 milk coolers. We are going to add value to our milk. What we should be doing is 
our milk from our farmers. We should be adding value, producing butter, using it to produce uh, um, powder, and go and sell it in DRC, go and sell it in uh, Central Africa, go and sell it in West Africa. And then we get the cheaper milk from Uganda and we drink. Cindy, <laughs> yeah. Instead of having a quarrel with <laughs> having a quarrel with Uganda, why are we having a quarrel with Uganda? We are having a quarrel with Uganda because we have refused to take our rightful place in 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 in, in our continent. We should have made more steps. And, and allow Uganda to come and occupy the next place as we move ahead. Are we together good people? So we must have a different conversation. And I am happy that Moses is here. I have confidence in what Moses can do. I know he has a good brain. And working with you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This Moses Kuria, forget about the noise sometimes he makes. <laughs> I promise you, he has a good brain. So we're going to work together in this space. And I want to give you, you know very well that I'm not a lazy person. Yeah? So I will work with you and I will make sure that whatever opportunities that can be actualized, working together with you, we actualize those opportunities and move our manufacturing to 20% of our GDP in the next couple of years, eight years, if not less. <clears throat> Access to credit is a big component of our plan. Financing is going to be a big component of our plan. There are some that we can cover with the Hustler Fund, but of course we have the Kenya uh, uh, KDC. KDC is going to cover your space. That is the area where we need to raise capital for industrialization. Capital for manufacturing. Capital for value addition. So that we can work with the SMEs, make sure they have access to credit, but also build the capacity of our Kenya Development Corporation so that we can also have resources available for the people in your space. So, uh, good people, I am very happy this morning that we are having a progressive conversation. And I am very confident that going into the future, Kenya is going to move to the next level in our manufacturing and industrialization scale. I am looking forward, as we have all said, by 2030, we should be producing a million more jobs from manufacturing. We should take uh, our manufacturing from the current uh, one trillion of our, of our GDP to maybe three or four trillion of our GDP. We should be able to move our contribution in terms of, uh, of, of, of tax revenues and be able to work together. And I understand, and Mburu here will tell you, I have had a very intense conversation with him on matters tax. Yes. I've had a very intensive conversation with him. I have asked him very difficult questions because part of our revenue gets lost because the stamps that you use on your manufactured goods, we have more fake stamps than genuine stamps. How is that possible? You know, we, we have to sort that out because we are losing revenue. Part of why our contribution of uh, manufacturing to GDP in terms of revenue is low is because very many people pocket our money, or the money meant for, meant for taxes. So we're going to reform that space. Mr. Mburu and his team have very clear instructions for me on where we should go. I believe that in the next two years, we should be able to move our revenues from two trillion to three trillion, and to double it in the next five years. Many people may not like that story because it means we are all paying taxes. But I'm sorry, everybody, we must all pay taxes. And I will lead the way by paying taxes. 
There will be no exemptions for people who are politically connected. There will be no exemptions for nobody. It's going to be the same yardstick for everybody. Are we, are we, are we, are we together? That's the direction we are going to go. And I want to promise you, good people, that we will also make our tax a regime predictable. I agree with you. I agree with you. Investments in manufacturing are long-term investments. You need a predictable tax regime so that you can know how your investments are going to look, uh, are going to look like. So this is the first one is winner in human resource management, BKR Apiaris. Congratulations, congratulations. The second one, Your Excellency, winner in product design and development, Mark Dave Holdings. Mark Dave Quickly, thank you. We receive the award. Uh, Mark Dave Holdings, kindly don't just move just yet. The third award, congratulations. The third award, Your Excellency Mark Dave Holdings, winner in good manufacturing practices. Thank you. Winner in strategy supply chain management, BK Apiaris. Quickly. BK Apiaris. Quickly, we move, we move fast. The rest of us can sit kindly. BK Apiaris. The next winner in innovative sales marketing strategies, Said Naturals. Said Naturals, quickly. <laughs> winner in strategy planning, strategic planning, gel your collections, gel your collections, quickly. Gel your quickly. And now the overall. Gel your. The overall, the second runners up, Jerry, Jerry, quickly, kindly, thank you. In the overall category, the second runners up is Mark Dave Holdings. Mark Dave, quickly, thank you. To be followed by first runners up, Jerry, your collections, Jerry, your kindly, move quickly. Thank you, those are the first runners up. And the overall winner, the overall winner, Overall winner, Your Excellency, Big Care Apiaris. To apologize for my company, Big Care Apiaris, as they collect the overall prize. Haraka Kidogo Dugu, Haraka Kidogo Asante, you are the overall winner. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Your Excellency.